Um, I have a, a two-part question, first part very short. Uh, I think a lot of people have difficulty valuing businesses because of some uh, convoluted accounting schemes that, that are out there. Do you have any uh, suggestions in terms of books or something you can read where you can sort of make sense of some of the accounting uh, stories that are going around? Well, that's a good question. And Abe Breloff used to write for Barron's quite frequently on, on various accounting machinations, and, and, and Barron's has continued that somewhat. But you're right that there are people out there who will try to paint pictures with accounting that are something far from economic reality. And sometimes the rules of accounting themselves lead to that. Uh, I would say that when the accounting confuses you, I would just tend to forget about it at, uh, as, a, as a company. I mean, it, it, it's probably, it may well be intentional, and in any event, you don't want to, you don't want to go near it. I, I, we have never had any great investment results from companies whose accounting we regarded as suspect. I can't, I can't think of a one. Can you try? No. Mm -hmm. no. It, it, it's, a, it's a very bad sign. I it, made uh, a short sale once that worked out well <laughs> in a case like that. No. It really, accounting, uh, accounting can be a, uh, accounting can offer you a lot of insight into the character of, of, of management. Uh, and I would say there's a lot, you know, there's a, you run into a fair amount of uh, bad accounting. You used to call it creative accounting, but you, it, um, uh, and you probably run into a lot more if it was allowed, but some companies have been able to push their auditors pretty far, and, and uh, I would be very skeptical of anything that that looks suspicious to you. I think there have been, a, there have been a couple of things written, but I can't, I can't think of where they've appeared, where people talk about the questions of, you know, what, Obviously, if, if some prepaid expense uh, deferred asset accounts start building up uh, suspiciously high and inventories look out of line, you know, with sales and particularly the trend of them and all that, you, you want to look twice at companies like that. Life insurance, uh, you know, frequently, uh, you know, we see weak accounting in it. Uh, you can... When you don't have a product where revenues and expenses are being matched up on something close to cash in the short term, you have the opportunity for people playing games with numbers. And, and some people have learned how to do that very well, and they've, and they've sometimes created long-lasting stock manipulation or promotion schemes that have enriched themselves at the, where they've enriched the managers or the creators of it at the expense of the public over time. If you ever get suspicious about accounting, just go on to the next company. Hello, my name is Peter Bevelin from Sweden. Uh, what is the absolutely first question you ask yourself when you look at a potential investment? And do you and Mr. Munger ask yourself the same first question? Yeah. Well, I think, I don't, I don't ask myself whether Charlie's going to like it, because <laughs> that will be a tough one. I, uh, now, the first question is, can I understand it? Uh, and uh, unless it's unless it's uh, going to be in a business that I think I can understand, there's no sense there's no sense looking at there's no sense kidding myself into thinking that I'm going to understand some software company or or some uh, uh, biotech company or something of sort. What the hell am I going to know about it? I mean, you know, I can. Uh, so that's the first threshold question. And then the second question is, you know, does it look like it have has good economics? Does it? Has it earned high returns on capital? You know, is it, does it strike me as something that's likely to do that? And uh, then I sort of go from there. How about you, Charlie? Yeah, I, I, we tend to judge by the past record. By and large, if the thing has a lousy past record and a bright future, we, we're going to miss the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zone two. <laughs> Hi, I'm just Keith. I'm Keith Breyer from uh, San Francisco. I have a question. When you're valuing the companies and you discount back the future earnings that you talked about, how many years out do you generally go? And if you don't go out a general number of years, how do you arrive at that time period? Well, that's that's a, a very good question, and it's it's I mean it's the heart of investing or buying businesses, which we regard as the same thing, but. 
and it is the framework in which we operate. I mean, we are trying to look at businesses in terms of what kind of cash can they produce if we're buying all of them, or will they produce if we're buying part of them, and there's a difference. Uh, and then at what discount rate do we do we bring it back? And, and the, I think your question was how far out do we look and all that. Despite the fact that we can define that in, in a very kind of simple and direct equation, you know, we are, we, we've never actually sat down and, and, and written out a set of numbers that uh, to relate that equation. We do it in our heads in a way, uh, obviously. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. But uh, there's no piece of paper, uh, and, and, and we never, there never was a piece of paper that shows what our calculation on Hellsbergs or Seas Candy or the Buffalo News was in that respect. Uh, so it would be attaching a little more scientific uh, quality to our analysis than there really is if I gave you some gobbledygook about, well, we do it for 18 years and stick a terminal value on and do all of this. Uh, we are sitting at the, in the office thinking about that question with each business or each investment. And we, we have discount rates in, in a general way in mind, but uh, we really like the decision to be obvious enough to us that it doesn't require making a detailed calculation. And, and uh, uh, it's the framework, but it's not applied in the sense that we actually fill in all the variables. Is that a fair way of saying it, Charlie? Yeah, Berkshire is, is, is being run the way Thomas Hunt Morgan, the great Nobel laureate, ran the biology department at Caltech. He banned the Frieden calculator, which was the computer of that era. And people said, how can you do this? Every place else in Cal Caltech, we have Frieden calculators going everywhere. And he said, well, we're picking up these great nuggets of gold just by organized common sense, and resources are short and we're not going to resort to any damn placer mining as long as we can pick up these major aggregations of gold. Uh, that's the way Berkshire works, and I hope the placer mining era will never come. Somebody once subpoenaed our staffing papers on some acquisition, and of course not only did we not have any staffing papers, we didn't have any staff. <laughs> 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 Zone two. A Larry Myers from Omaha. Warren, two quick questions. Uh, the first one, very brief. Do you have any timetable regarding when you will write your own book about your career in philosophy? Yes, my timetable has always been six months from now. <laughs> <laughs> the answer on that is I, I've, I've thought about doing it a few times, and I, and I think about it. It always seems to me there's way more interesting, there are more interesting things yet to happen than have happened so far, and I don't want to. Uh, I know I won't write a second one, so I keep postponing it. That's my that's my rationale on it anyway. I have had great difficulty enabling my children to know what I know, and uh, Warren, maybe you have failed less. <laughs> My children, in many ways, are a lot smarter than I am, so I had a different experience, Charlie. Yeah. No, I, I think you can, um, you know, I, I've mainly learned by reading myself, so I, 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 uh, I, don't, I don't think I have any original ideas that uh, I certainly, uh, but I've certainly got a lot. I mean, I've talked about reading Graham. I read Phil Fisher, and uh, uh, I've, I've gotten a lot of ideas uh, myself from reading, and uh, in my own case, I mean, talk about your parents having influence. You know, my parents had enormous influence, so I, I think you can, I think you can learn a lot from other people. In fact, I think if you learn reasonably well from other people, you don't have to get any new ideas or do much on your own. You can just apply the best of what you see. Generally speaking, I think we always get a group of, of wise people, after sifting millions, but uh, I don't think anybody's invented a way to teach so that. Everybody is wise. It's, a, it's extraordinary how resistant some people are to learning anything. Well, and it really, and what it's astounding is it's, 
how resistant they are when it's their so, in their self-interest to learn. I mean, I was always astounded by, by how much attention was was paid to Graham. I mean, he was he was regarded 40 years ago as the dean of security analysts, but how little attention was paid in terms of the principles he taught. And uh, it wasn't because people were refuting them, and it wasn't because people didn't have a self-interest in, in learning sound investment principles. It, it was just this incredible resistance to thinking or change. I mean, I quoted Bertrand Russell one time as saying, uh, who said that, uh, um, most men would rather die than think. Many have, you know, and uh, in the financial sense, that's uh, that's very true. It, uh, it it it's not complicated. I mean, with human relations, you know, usually aren't that complicated. But and certainly, it's in people's self-interest to develop uh, habits that work well in human relations. But uh, an amazing number of people seem to mess it up one way or another. Yeah. 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 How much has Berkshire Hathaway been copied either in Investing America or Corporate America? I'm not saying we deserve to be necessarily, but but uh, people don't want to do it differently than they're presently doing it. You might argue that Mrs. B, having started what you may have seen out there this weekend with $500 in 1937, you know, with without a day in school in our life, and building that into a great enterprise, you might say, well, that is something to study. I mean, it, uh, it, you know, is it because she couldn't speak English when we got, you know, she got over her? Maybe we <laughs> cleanse right. people. I mean, what what are the what, you know what is there to learn from seeing somebody create an incredible success like that in a competitive business? She didn't invent something that that uh, the world had never seen before. She didn't have a lock on some piece of real estate that protected her from competition. You know, all of these, and yet she accomplished something that virtually no one has accomplished. Now, why aren't business schools studying her? You know, why are they talking about EVA, you know, economic value added, as we talked about earlier? Any of the, I mean, here is a success. Something has made her a success. You know, is it something, is it a 200, and it, she's very smart, but it, is it a 220 IQ? No, it, it isn't. It's a very smart woman, but it's not, it's not something that's incapable of being replicated in the habits and the way of thinking. But who is studying her? I mean, they present her as a curiosity, but if you go to any of the top 20 business schools, you know, there's not one page that's being given to anybody to study what is an incredible success. And, I, it, I, I just I find that very interesting that, uh, uh, and to some extent, you know, I've seen it in the investment world. There's, there's this, for one thing, the high, you know, it, it, it's probably a little discouraging to a professor of management at some major business school that, who's gone on to get his doctorate and everything to think he has to come on, hang around the furniture mart, <laughs> and <laughs> study a woman in a golf cart. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> But you could, they'd be better off if they did. Where were we on that? Uh, what zone are we on? Four, are we? Wherever it is, zone, th zone three maybe, huh? Yes, thank you. I'm Jim Ludke from Phoenix, Arizona, and I haven't been to one of your annual meetings for about 10 years now. The last one was down at the Red Lion Inn by the water, and uh, I congratulate you on your popularity. I wish I'd bought more stock, and, <laughs> but like Charlie, I too have been giving mine away for charitable purposes, so your beneficial effects have uh, reciprocated and rippled throughout the economy. I congratulate you. Well, I congratulate you. What, uh, what do you think has changed? Well, one thing is that Ben Graham commenting on what you just said, uh, I'm a student of Ben Graham, and <clears throat> he said it never ceased to amaze me how widely read he was and least followed. But how have you changed in the last 10 years? I mean, much, if any, or none at all, or? Uh... Well, we'll let Charlie, he'd been watching me. <laughs> I'd, I'd say about one stone. <laughs> Takes one to know one. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if we'd wanted to change, we would have changed a long time ago. I mean, I, I've never believed much in this theory of, you know, if I, if I have, X 
two X instead of X, then I'm going to do this or that, and you know, or I'll take this job I don't like now and I'll get a, one I like later on. Or it doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, there aren't there aren't that many years around, so you ought to be doing what you like at the present time. And and Charlie and I have always followed that pretty well. <laughs>